Hey everyone, welcome back to JLXP. The summer split regular season is over. We only had one tiebreaker game, which is far fewer than we expected at the start of the day. I thought Emily and I were going to be doing this much <laughs> later in the day, <laughs> even though the, it is 840 at the moment. But yeah, what were you going to say? I was just going to say the the Golden Guardians dig game had me worried. Yes. Because... Anyone who watched the broadcast on Friday knows one of the scenarios I actually previewed was the scenario that we did almost get in regards to having Dig still be able to make playoffs mm -hmm. by forcing the three-way tie between them, Golden Guardians, and Immortals. Yeah, and let me just say, I hope we slightly change the playoff system for next year. I think yeah. the possibility of a three-way tie for eighth of like a playoff spot of the three teams that are on massive losing streaks and we could have had a three-way tie at four and 14 like yeah. there, there's something there that is just fundamentally wrong to me when we're calling that a playoff team and we also have a 15 and 3 eg that is also a playoff team so yeah some, something's off i i, I, like I was gonna say i don't know how much you want to get into format i think I like that ours indexes into summer because essentially, mm -hmm. like, I get that the thought process is we have eight teams because this is the championship. It's not Correct. just playoffs. So this qualifies our teams for Worlds. But, and I've argued this with other people, I actually don't like how it completely throws out spring. Mm -hmm. I don't think in any way spring should be weighted equally with summer. I think summer should actually always be weighted more. Um yeah. But I do like the idea that your spring performance does count for something. Like, mm, I mm. I think uh, LPL, I don't think we should do LPL format because obviously they have 17 teams and their bracket is freaking massive. <laughs> yeah. And it, it starts next week and it goes for like three weeks. Or mm -hmm. no, longer than that. It's, it's just an, an insane amount of games. It's a number of games. Um, yeah. And then they have a regional qualifier on top of that. But I do like the idea that Number one in spring auto qualifies. Mm. Number two typically qualifies on points just because the amount of points you get for second place in summer is still so high yeah. that it's really difficult to not auto qualify off of that. And then the sec the third and fourth teams are decided by a regional bracket. Right. I like the little regional bracket thing because like, I know people say, and again, like, sorry, this is a massive tangent before we even it's start. Okay. But yeah. like, that's why I put the uh, little things in the video. If you want to skip to the first team discussion, <laughs> yeah, you can you can skip, you can skip over to our retrospective yeah. later uh, and go away from Emily rants about playoff formats. But um, the I like the idea that there's a little regional like second not like almost second chance qualifier. And I actually think it still makes it more hype because the argument against it is always like, well, that's anti-hype because it comes after finals. And mm. it's like, well, I think finals is always going to be hype. And you already know your three worlds teams before you're qualifying for finals. So you could also make the argument that that is kind of anti-hype. I don't mm. necessarily think it is, but I don't think it takes away from the kind of drama of a regional qualifier right. if you don't already know like your three worlds teams because the three teams that make it to chicago are going to be our three worlds teams and we'll already yeah. know that just like we knew it for houston uh yeah. in spring we knew that one of those three teams was going to be qualifying to msi you took it the different direction around worlds teams i was going to go around the seven and eight and calling them playoff teams i would call them i would just call them play oh, I, teams. I would have I would make it a oh I didn't even think about yeah, that. So the, make it like a play in. Yeah, mine is kind of somewhat similar to the NBA play in where they've managed to get ten teams in their playoffs with like without actually letting ten teams into their playoffs, and you play those games first. So rather than starting, mm. rather than starting the losers bracket, like those losers bracket teams, TSM and Golden Guardians are going to be sitting around for two weeks before we see them in the playoffs. Yeah, I would like basically maybe even tomorrow. Like as quickly as possible, mm -hmm. have them do, I don't want to do a full NBA format. I would actually just take six, seven, and eight. And I would have seven play eight, winner then play six in best of threes. And that's how you get your top six. 
So like and do like a you, little gauntlet. Yeah, so yeah. You still okay. Have something I like to that, kind actually. of play for at the end of the year, but you're not saying like eight qualifies for playoffs. It's like no, eight stays alive, and then if they go on a big fatty run, then they have the right to play a real playoff series. But I don't want to give them these big playoff series for going four and fourteen. Hell no. Yeah, uh, that makes sense. I was just gonna say cut out the, the seven eight entirely <laughs> yeah. and go and fair. go back to and go back to like a, a championship point regional qualifier mm-hmm. so like if you do have a massive outlier where like c9 in 2015 for example had a horrendous regular yeah, season seven. but but then made this like really miraculous regional qualifier run that was like super dramatic and interesting with high and the jungle position like that's a, still a story people remember to this day yeah and it's because they still had enough leftover championship points from spring true because they'd true. done so well back then yeah, and then we have the EU system, which factors in championship points for playoff <laughs> seeding, but you still have to be a top six team in summer to make it. I checked on this earlier because you and I were talking about this before the day. The championship yeah. points ended up actually not making that much of a difference. So like their summer playoffs, the only two teams that have a different summer standing than what their championship points add up to are Rogue and Mad Lions. And Rogue yeah. was was second in summer, but third in champ points. And Rogue is the opposite, three and two. Everyone else actually matched it perfectly. So it ended up not doing really crazy things, even though it had the potential to do really crazy things had their their week not ended the way it did. They had some some wild tiebreakers as well. But, oh, yeah. Joe, you looked excited about Oh, no, time. I was just going to, I was going to say the big thing would have been if, is the thing you and I were talking about was actually yeah. if Fnatic don't make it, they're, spring points just evaporate like yes. they don't they disappear into the ether even though they which could is have also won very like, weird they could have won like nine games which is like kind of a respectable summer just a little bit off and then not made it but yeah um, much like when Fnatic nearly didn't qualify for the eu lcs in 2013 <laughs> people just forget that there was this really shaky thing that almost ended them uh but they're they're good now they made it to the lcs they won several titles and and we're finally going to start the episode for real now. So, yeah. EG, the best split in their history. Rather than doing a playoff preview, I think we can kind of take this episode to go through a little bit of what our expectations were for the teams coming into the split and how they delivered on some of those expectations. So, EG is one who, even though they did win spring, they were an 8-8 eight and eight team in spring, and we were just looking back at this. They actually lost the first round of the playoffs to Team Liquid 3-2. Yep. The only team to take a game off them in the loser's bracket ended up being FlyQuest before they then swept three series in a row against C9, TL, and then 100 Thieves towards the title. So this crazy run. But we are like, I wonder how they're going to sustain this. And then to go 15-3 and three is just actually super impressive with the msi hangover and everything couple couple extra stats i had written down here which have actually disappeared on me temporarily got him Uh-oh. danny has his third split in the row of leading the lcs and kills he fbi is second it was actually pretty close a career high in dpm 786 dpm he was 588 in spring and it's not like DPM was mega inflated this split. The next closest AD carry was FBI at 610. So like Danny was way above everyone in DPM in third split in a row with kills. Inspired kind of goes without saying. I think he's going to be the MVP. Uh, but what are, you, what are you, some of the, your takeaways from EG so far in the summer split? I was going to say my fun wonky stat is that Inspired jumped up to being tied for third with most solo kills at six. <laughs> with the... Uh, yeah, because he's four see. today what? in the game. Yeah. Whippo, Philip, and him, and then Gomsu as well had six six solo kills. Wow. Oh, he had that game where he was on Shivana and he just kept solo killing. I oh, think it was Oh, yeah. Yeah. So okay. The solo kill stat's so weird because you want to use it as this big, yeah. like, hold it up. And they're like, well, actually, no, he just 1v3. I'm so like, that counts oh, for three. Kinda, yeah, that's hilarious. Um, the thing that's super impressive to me about EG was a, I actually, I know a lot of people have ragged on their MSI performance just because of the G2 record. Mm. I actually thought they did like, they didn't collapse, right? 
Mm-hmm. They did a respectable enough job, even in the RNG series where they were just very visibly outclassed by a better team. They hung in there. They had some good team fights. I was like, okay, like that's that's good. And then you never know because talking to North American teams when they go abroad, it's always like we need to somehow encapsulate what we learned and sustain it. And the sustaining it is really difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think what's most impressive about EG is that even when they were looking not as good as we know they can be, they were still very strong. They were still very cohesive, which is the most important thing. And talking to the players about what they were working on, like, you know, uh, Inspired had talked about having better jungle to lane communication than mm-hmm. he previously had. Um, Jojo had talked about how he didn't realize that other mid laners did so much for their teams, right? Uh, until he had to face players like Xiaohu, who has just such a phenomenal understanding of when he can drop waves in mid to help side lanes, when he can yeah. go to side lanes, when he's going to um, meet up with Wei or um, Ming on like routine rotations to kind of try to catch people out. And he, you could tell that he was working on this theoretically because I keep, and I know I keep going to back to this game. I feel like I've talked about it here. I know I've talked about it on broadcast. I keep going back to that one game five against TL in the upper bracket okay. where they picked Nidalee Renekton. And they look like they're set, you know, impact setting up the wave and someone calls it off. Like there are pings mm. to go down. You know, they're going to, they're going to do this very patented, like we're stacking, stacking the wave. We're going to dive. Yep. Um, on the earliest timer. Uh, and it doesn't happen for whatever yeah. reason. They call it off. And you see Jojo recognize this. And he's like, well, if I can't get anything like if we don't do this if we don't get this renekton ahead if we don't get this nidalee renekton set up going our entire team comp falls apart right so he does something that ends up looking really stupid which is he drops i i want to say it ends up being three waves mid to go topside to try to make a play on a rotation and that tells me that theoretically he was already studying what mid laners do do out of lane, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what does that mean to go to side lanes? When are you supposed to do it? How does it tie into your team composition? And so I'm not going to say, like, that was a good play because it wasn't, but I liked what it told me about JoJo the player and, Mm -hmm. like, the team itself, right? Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is one thing that he has improved on massively, in regards to a how the team kind of moves with him and how he moves with the team because we saw yeah. him go topside earlier today and I actually thought C9's uh, early to mid cross map trading in that game was really good like really smart but he he does get um, you know he does get bullied by Jensen. Jensen actually kind of has yeah. control over the, the lane, even with, ins- yeah, like even with Inspired visiting the lane, kind of trying to make sure that he is not going to um, end up getting like, you know, sh- automatically shoved in and, and losing all pressure, right? It t- takes a lot of time just to make it be okay. And he goes top for a kill. And the timing of that, even though it wasn't necessarily like, he didn't lose a lot. Like, it just told me, like, oh, okay. It reminded me of that Nidalee Renekton play, even yeah. though that was a completely different situation. Sense. And it's like, I can see that you are so much more thoughtful as a player about when to go to side lanes, when you can do it, what it's going to do for you, what it's going to do for your teammates. Like, I don't know who made that call because this entire team seems very locked in in terms of, like, mm-hmm. how they work together, which mm-hmm. is also a strength. But, like, overall, that is the kind of stuff I still like to see in terms of how are we sustaining what we actually learned and keeping it both in theory and in practice throughout the season. And their consistency over the season and not having to overly rely on, like, individual outplays, which still does sometimes happen, obviously, because they're all really good players. 
um, has been super impressive because I actually did think they were going to go in and look really, really shaky for the first yeah, few I weeks. thought they were probably going to win 11 or 12 games coming into the split just because I was ex- – like I have yet to see an NA team go to MSI and come back stronger. And I knew they were coming off the 9-9 nine nine, even if they were just the title – uh, winners, so I really didn't expect them to play at that level. And I like, I like your point about JoJo, and it's going to make it super interesting when we get to award voting, which both of us are going to be diving uh, into in the next couple of days. Because it's like so hard, but specifically for mid lane, like what has JoJo really done wrong this split? It doesn't seem like much. His stats are very not impressive, but it's judging like he sacrifices for his team, his team gives back. You don't want to fall into the trap of. Oh, they are fifteen and three. Therefore, they are all the best because you can't distinguish or differentiate who is contributing most to their success. But it is, in many ways, the correct way to play mid lane, and it is like it is distinctly different than actually the way Bjergsen is playing mid lane because Bjergsen's stats are mm-hmm. the best. He did die like four or five times in that final game, which is going to hurt his KDA, which had been so ridiculous. But Bjergsen even was getting solo kills, and Bjergsen was still doing high DPM and team fights, but they played almost in like kind of polar opposite to each other in terms of how much they manage their wave and set up their own wave for their own wave success versus how much they go to try and impact the rest of the map, almost like a second jungler. And EG has definitely been the team that finds more success with this strategy. And yeah, you just kind of, I, I just kind of have to hand it to them, and I think they should be the clear favorites going into playoffs to to repeat as champions. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I feel like they deserve that benefit of the doubt. Yeah, let's go to 100 Thieves, who we were talking right before this podcast, 14-4. and four. It's mm-hmm. two games better than their best split ever. And it really didn't feel like that based on the conversations we were having, based on a lot of the community sentiment. Maybe you know, I don't go to the 100 Thieves subreddit enough, but... Like, it it very much was their best split ever. It's the most consistent that they've been able to play. The amount of time the team has spent together has led to them being much better in clutch situations. Again, today, against Team Liquid, I'd even say both of their games against Team Liquid this split, where they were in very, you would say, losable situations, but they Mm -hmm. just played so much better than Team Liquid in the mid and late game around objectives, around team fights, mainly just in general coordination, and they get the first round by for it. Like, it is completely well-deserved. But I guess, like, kind of mind-checking, is this the best 100 Thieves has ever been? Yeah, it's weird to say because you would think in your head, like, oh, it has to be the roster, like, the the year that they won, right? Yeah. But most people, I would say, weren't expecting them to win, even though they were performing well right Mm -hmm. so i think the big interesting thing to me about 100 thieves that i saw today or heard from their game today was actually that who he admitted that they had misunderstood the the matchup and thought they would have push and like props to jay for admitting this but like he basically was like yeah we thought we were gonna have push there so we were calling for this And you know what? They didn't have push because that was when Santorin came down and actually ganked off of the push that TL had, which set the Sivir way ahead of where she should have been at Mm -hmm. that point in the game. Um, And then from that point on, TL were like running over their bot lane. So to hear that like that one small kind of thought was like, oh, we're going to have this and that didn't work out. And then they kind of, Wait, like actually survive it out to the point where mm-hmm. this Seraphine Senna combination is just stupid. Like yeah, it's so hard. In team fights. It's so hard to go up against this composition. Um, and you saw TL, it got more and more difficult for them, even when they did have a fed server. So it was really interesting to hear that because from hundred thieves themselves, cause like we've been hypercritical of them. I feel on broadcast. Yeah. Um, and a lot of it has to do with, and I know the last time I was on here, I brought up, I think it was RNG specifically, but like they're not the only LPL team that do it. It's just the one that always pops into my head is the team that did. Cause previously when they had UZI, they would give him a break. 
um, kind of in the beginning before, uh, before Chinese New Year. Mm-hmm. And uh, 100 Thieves seem like that kind of team. Not that they're not taking the regular season seriously, but like they know that they're so good and they also know that it is a very long season. And like, even when they're looking quote unquote shaky, they're still winning games. And it's not mm-hmm. just this split. I remember saying the exact same things about them last bit where we're like, 100 Thieves, like looking kind of shaky, like dropped the series and in lock into Dignitas, dropped another game to Dignitas in the regular season. And even then, they were still doing like really well. Yeah, they in at that one point split. in spring, at one point in spring, they were five and four, but then they ended 12 and six. So they yeah. ended really well. I think it was seven and two or eight and one in their last nine. And this this split, they were eight and one in their last nine, which is crazy good. It was so close. As so soon as we started nine talking nine. about the run, they, lose they, one game. they lost a game and then they won the rest of them. Um, but I, I mean, that's like the, the largest credit I can give 100 Thieves is like throughout this entire year, talking to their players on and off camera they seemed themselves to be super comfortable with where they were at. Like they were like, we feel, we feel great. Like, you know, talking to closer on desk, talking to uh, Jay in an interview I did with him when I was covering for Gabby when she was doing interviews. Like a lot of it was just like uh, talking to someday rather uh, in that interview, but talking to Jay before that, it was like, this team seems so comfortable with each other and so confident Mm -hmm. when Mm -hmm. everyone else is kind of nitpicking, you know, from game to game to game, which naturally a single game format is going to do that. Yep. But, um, the, their like kind of cool headedness as a team is something that's always really impressed me because they don't seem to like overreact to much. And I think it's a strength. Yeah. And I do want to give a little bit of context for the viewers on the, laning phase today and what most teams do. Oh yeah, sorry. As like, well, as like, the, this is a pregame checklist that most junglers do. Like you'll finish draft lane, you'll finish draft phase, and then your jungler is going to ask your lanes, do you get push? And what they mean by push is like, if I go to Scuttle Crab when it spawns, are you going to be there before the other lane? And it's a simple yes mm-hmm. or no. And then basically if the jungler realizes they have a place where like mid and bot both have push, okay, bot scuttle is completely free. I'm going to start topside. I'm going to get bot scuttle. That guarantees me an easy early game. When that assessment is wrong and he's actually started on the wrong side and then he doesn't get crab, it actually sets him up to get double crabbed in a lot of situations because he's pathed all the way to the wrong side only to realize the other jungler can push him off crab. And then if you needed a crab and lose it, the other jungler can easily take the other one. So it's really bad to to misassess a, line, a lane like that. But mm-hmm. as you said, they they did recover. And the point of what's happened in spring and summer with them, and maybe this is something, I mean, it is something that's definitely true, but I'm wondering how much we we should pivot on it in like a future split. Like it's so easy to anchor on your first impression of a team. Mm -hmm. And since hundred thieves had a pretty poor first three weeks of spring, and then Abadaga in particular had a bad first two weeks of summer It's like it took an extra long amount of time to recover to a baseline and then kind of get above water because looking at it holistically, this is the best regular season they've ever had and should Mm -hmm. be much more exciting going into the playoffs. And I, I think currently the standings are pretty accurate. Like I will be relatively surprised if it's not E.G. Hundred Thieves and T.L. that we're seeing in Chicago, Cloud Nine or yeah. C.L.G. I think have to make really big strides to break into that. Just like the consistency, the consistency that both Hundred Thieves and E.G. are able to put out, with E.G. only losing that one game to C.L.G., the one game to Hundred Thieves, and the one early game to T.L. and then two owing literally everybody else on yep. top of Hundred Thieves having the somewhat weak start and basically beating everyone in the second half of the season. Both of these teams are just incredibly hard to beat in a best of five with, with how consistent they've been, I think. Yeah. yeah. No, I agree. I still think it's going to be EG, 100 Thieves, and TL. Yeah. And I mean, something, TL really recovered a lot of reputation in the past two weeks, I think. Because I spent, speaking, speaking of like anchoring, right? 
TL anchored themselves at the 3-0 at the start of the year. And then it took like a series of 1-1s for me to get progressively more disappointed than them. But <laughs> then they started the mustache thing, won four games in a row, lose the game to 100 Thieves today, end up third. But aside from Closer's trash talk, which I think is Closer just being Closer, where he was just saying they always beat TL, which they kind of have in the past little bit. Uh, it was EG that said, oh yeah, all the teams, this was inspired, of all the teams, I think TL is the best. And he actually said like the other MVP candidate should be Bjergsen, was what Inspired was saying. Mm-hmm. And then also C9 talking about how confident they were that they would like not want to play TL in the first round. Like, very much not want to play TL instead of COG. And then I guess the third one is when we had Huhi doing the Proto Pro, and I asked yeah. him real quickly, like, who's going to win TLC9? He's like, oh, yeah, TL. So it's it definitely feels a little analogous to Spring, where everyone was losing scrims to EG, but they weren't winning games on stage. Kind of feels like TL is winning a lot of scrims and just wasn't putting it together on stage. Yeah, and I think in going back and watching, like, a lot of TL's games... Some of it is just draft, like at a certain point, unless they play out every single situation, like to a level of perfection that is very difficult with an early game draft against Mm -hmm. better scaling compositions. You're just going to end up losing out if you keep fighting over things. Um, But like, so there's some of that, but there's, then, then coupled with that, there was also the fact that there were a few times that maybe I should do like an actual video on this if I'm not like <laughs> lazy or just stream my prep, which would be really boring for people, I think. But uh, there were certain times where they would be setting up for stuff. And I, th- I, I'm surmising it's because these are all very experienced players, right? Yeah. And they do it to a level that does is not necessary, especially when you're trying to snowball a composition. Mm. Um, and so basically, like, in, in slamming all of these early games, the one thing I really wanted to see from Team Liquid is a continuation of that going forward. Like, you recognize that something like a Callista Amumu lane can actually take over the entire bot side of the map. Like you should, you should, if you snowball that lane super well, Mm -hmm. have control over basically effectively both sides of the jungle and Drake for the first 15 minutes or so of Mm -hmm. the game, at least. And then you snowball that from there. Right. And so I do think there were times when TL seemed to kind of slow down go through some maybe mental checklist in terms of how we have to set things up yeah. when they should have just been just consistently slamming. Yeah. yeah. They should have just kept slamming their advantages. Um, I don't know. Maybe this is LPL brain. You guys can call me on Reddit and call me an idiot if you want. But uh, like that was the thing I really wanted to see from them. I think we saw it in the EG game, which was awesome to see. Like mm. obviously mm. you don't want to put um you don't want to put too much stock in one game in particular, and especially one where their opponent maybe wasn't at their best because they'd just been told that they had to play from home. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but like that and their subsequent few games up until today, I was like, okay, I see them recognizing a lot more of these timing windows where they can really slam their advantages because that's all I wanted to see. Cause like, Mark brought up a good point on the desk today. Um, and we've talked about this. Players have talked about this in terms of differences between scrims and stage. Yeah. And when you're scrimming, A, you're you're just going to be a lot more aggressive and proactive anyway because you're trying stuff out. You're limit testing. That's actually literally what scrims are for. Mm-hmm. They're, they're not even necessarily for winning. Obviously, you still want to win. But, like, you want to practice. You want to practice doing things. And um, the you know, maybe the other team kind of checks out, you're in the middle of a scrim block or something, you know, like, and or you are going to be a lot more proactive automatically because you're like, we're, we're super far ahead, we're snowballing, Yeah, there's I mean, not as much pressure. Um, So I was happy, like, ultimately, sorry, this is very rambly, I was happy fine. to see that, I was happy to see flashes of that from TL um, this past week and I, uh, and, and last week. 
And I do hope that they carry that into their best of fives. I would say to add to your scrim point, it's not even necessarily that TL is playing more or less aggressive. It's that the team that's losing is way more willing to take massive game losing risks because mm-hmm. if they if it doesn't work at 12 minutes that that okay the game's over at 15 right or oh the game's over at 18 and they just then they just go next so that was that was the really interesting part about the 100 thieves game is like uh no team would play that disciplined in a scrim when TL has that kind of early game advantage and TL would actually mm. just win that game uh but Again, it's it's about getting more reps on that. And it is, I really do think it is because they have five veteran players, but those five veteran players do not play the same way. And that, to me, is the biggest... If we actually take the top four, and CLG fans are going to get really mad at me right now, but the top four from the start of the split, C9, TL, EG, and 100 Thieves, the main thing to me that moves EG and 100 Thieves above TL and C9 is the difference between having five talented players and a very talented team. There's 20 yeah. talented players on those four teams. There's only two teams that work well together. And TL and C9 just still aren't at that at that next point. But I like your I like your TL point. What were the time uh stamps just for the viewers? Because you did a bit of a TL deep dive. Like what were the time oh, yeah. windows where TL has been the most str- strugglesome? So when I compared all of the gold graphs, if I remember correctly, because basically what ended up happening is I did a VOD review and then I asked one of our stats people if they could slam all of the gold graphs on top of each other so I could see the timing windows are correct. And it was between 18 and 22 minutes. And then again, between 26 and 30. And today's game, interestingly enough... Between 26 and 30, they lost their lead. Yeah, there was a small spike slightly before that, but then it was almost at 30 was when the the lead change was. And the lead change timing isn't necessarily always accurate because they might have start like like in today's game for example against uh, 100 thieves they might have already started to slowly lose out on fights slowly mm-hmm. you see how 100 thieves composition is going to be really strong is getting stronger uh i mean i know this is the tl section but like shout out to abadaga for some amazing talia walls today mm-hmm. in terms of like that was part of why they were able to stall out so much is because the way he was separating fights was so smart um but the it doesn't necessarily reflect it. You could see the kind of gradual thing, but the lead change was almost exactly at 30 minutes, if I remember, mm, from today. Yeah. Also, uh, if in the future you can't contact the stats team, you know Games of Legends has gold graphs that you can also like select and deselect Didn't. whatever number of games you want. Yeah, yeah. I'll sh- I'll I've been trying to use our internal thing. I know. The Games of Legends gold graphs are It got are broken. Great. The Games of Legends gold graphs so. are amazing. Yeah. Okay, let's let's go to the let's go to the next team, CLG. The the surprise team in the top four. They were projected to be much worse. I feel like they've rallied around the fact that they are not, and they've used that very well as a motivating call. Like being able like Dokla came out at the very start of the spring and said that they're that he thinks they can be top three. They very nearly were finishing Mm -hmm. fourth but somewhat of a deflating week they were one and two even though they had the potential to maybe jive with tl and and steal up into a higher seed but they dropped a couple of games how how are you feeling now about clg and i guess it kind of depends like are you considering them in this group of contenders or you're just like oh no but they're the best of the rest so clg have some really great things that will serve them super well in best of fives. And then they have some major opportunity areas that will not serve them well in best of fives. Um, And you could see both on display this week. Mm -hmm. Uh, I continue to be impressed with the early windows they find for uh, first bloods for Mm. this team. Mm -hmm. Um, As people know, I've been tracking the timing of it. Um, because when we got that, when I pulled a bunch of early game stats for CLG C9, mm-hmm. 
in week seven, I believe. Yeah. Um, I was like, wait a minute, because these are bloody teams. But then I was like, wait a minute, this first blood time is super early. And then you called it out on cast. You were like, wait, they're at like 328. Yeah, months? as their average. Yeah. yeah. Which is nuts. Um, so I started tracking them. And they're so good at finding these really early windows, especially, I mean, obviously it depends on what contracts is on, but talking to him off camera, uh, he said this on camera too, but like he really prefers playing things where he can affect his lanes early, right? So even if it is something that maybe you wouldn't think would affect lanes early, like he wants to do something with that. He really wants to be in lanes as early as possible, you know, level two, level three, if possible. Um, and a lot of these CLG first blood situations are really interesting. And I like the way that they play their early game because they are always reaching, right? Like they mm -hmm. are always trying to continuously push the tempo of the game so that their opponents are kind of breathless and like can't catch up. And I think that's something that can serve you really well. Um, I think it's something that has served them really well, especially when Palafox can find a good window to roam to sides. If he can join up with contracts or if he can just pull off a gank himself, bot or top, mm -hmm. it obviously has also served them well. And I think like if you want, we like we haven't even mentioned his name for most improved, but like he's actually been legitimately very good this split as a player, Palafox has. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I feel like people still don't give him enough credit for how good he's been. To He's's be quite honest, game today was also sick. He just the team comp <laughs> yeah. was there. He was one and zero, and we're like, okay, Palafox is going to carry this game. And then like five minutes later, he's five and zero. The story behind uh, Poom saying "I can ult you, I can ult you," and then him going in and yeah, just dying and was himself. was amazing. Um. <laughs> But yeah, I think so. I think that is going to serve them really well. I think their draft creativity, they have some really cool flexes between top and mid that not a lot of other teams have mm -hmm. in adding Dokla to the team, which I find super, super interesting. And now the flip side to that so they have draft creativity, their players work well together, they're really proactive and aggressive, right? And both of those things, so th those two things are different things, and CLG is both of them. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> the other side the TSM game was the most frustrating I think to watch for okay. me with with uh, 100 Thieves was also a very frustrating game obviously I know they really would have wanted that because again they were in a position where they could have won that game Yep. Um, but the TSM one was the most frustrating because a lot of these catches that TSM were making were on very routine rotations that you make around the map and TSM were just waiting to like pick them off. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you are, uh, you know, a team that might be struggling a little bit more as, as uh, I believe Chime even said this on the desk okay. and also off, but I believe he said it on air too. If he didn't, he said it behind the scenes to us. Yeah. So it basically like, when they have a comp like this, when they feel like maybe they're getting outpaced, the best thing they could think to do was kind of like set up in these routine locations, hopefully have better vision control and like catch someone out. Yeah. And it happened multiple times. And like if a team like TSM who's had some struggles with like cohesion and they've had multiple roster changes, you know, like if a team like TSM can do that to you, then a team like TL e.g. 100 Thieves, certainly will be able mm -hmm. to, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason why I'm bringing up those three teams is because they're the three teams above them in the standing. So yeah. I think I'm, of all teams, CLG are the ones I'm most excited about to see in best of fives because I want them to prove me wrong, yeah. right? Like, I really do. I hope they do. I'm of the same mind where I really, I really want them to succeed. It's so, I'd say like, exciting or endearing i'm not sure which word i'm going to choose it's a combination between the two of just like seeing clg fans be happy because they're like to me some of the truest lcs fans because if you're a clg fan 
you're generally a fan from their glory days back in 2015 and you have stuck with it even if you're not watching every game for like seven years. And I just love having that type of loyalty rewarded. But in in the weeds of it all, there are definitely... I mean, there's a lot of red flags. I don't want to do a full preview of CLG versus Cloud9. There are red flags for both of these teams in terms mm-hmm. of uh, what is going to stop them from going to Worlds, which I think is going to be the goal pretty much for both of them, even if C9 might have in the back of their heads like a goal of the LCS title. The, the first blood one is one that I... We're, we're in a long-form podcast, so I can, I can go into this a little bit more. Is less likely to work in a best of five if mm-hmm. the team is willing to do like a deep amount of scouting and they trust the person who's doing the scouting because I haven't done this because we prep every team every week. But like if someone sits down and actually tracks contracts jungle pathing for 18 games, what patterns are they going to find, right? Because I, mm-hmm. for instance, I did this or I, I had people do this back in 2020 when I was on TL going into playoff series where you're tracking like, okay, how many games does this player gank before crap? And some players were at like 12 of 18 and some players were at one. So that completely changes the way your laners are able to think about the game, even if generally you're just reacting. And if there there is a level of cheese to what he's doing, it's not going to work over best of five series, even though it is going to work when you're just playing this team the one time as one of two opponents in the regular season. Mm-hmm. So it's, I haven't done it. I don't know if there are patterns like that, but that's one way you can punish that. And then the second way would be just like, everyone knows that Seraphine is a big pick for them. Don't get surprised by it. You're much less likely yeah. to have that happen in a best of five situation because you can either decide to ban it from the very start or you can find a practice opponent that is actually able to practice it against you. Not sure exactly who C9 is going to be able to book for scrims next week, but that's another possibility. So some of the things that COG has been able to generate wins off of are possibly easier to prepare for than the things that C9 is going to generate wins off of, which is like, oh yeah, Berserker is just an animal in team fights. And like, can you outlane Jensen and Fudge? Those are just more repeatable things. Um, so that's why I worry for CLG, even though I would freaking love it if they won that series. Like I would love it if they yeah. won that series and moved into the, the winner's bracket semifinal. It's also interesting. So the the other thing I will say about CLG is we talk about like how aggressive their early game is, right? In terms of first blood time, in terms of uh, their kills plus assists at 15 average, which is 9.2. They're actually ahead of TL at 9.1. But then TL's goal difference is almost 18K. And CLG is all... 1800 yeah, yeah. 1800 yeah sorry wow i'm tired um 18k would be like yeah they have all the impossible oh uh, yeah <laughs> i don't even know if that's mathematically possible to be honest uh and clg is at 109 right if you look at obviously they have the highest first blood percentage yeah. but then first turret percentage they're tied for second at 55.6 which is a drop up of TL and EG who are both at 77.8 um, Drake they're tied for well they're tied for a bunch of teams at 50% um, the Drake so like that's are not actually so close this year that was the one yeah, when I was looking wow. through stats earlier like everyone is just taking like roughly half the Drakes <laughs> um, all year long yeah and their forward percentage is still like good again, but like if you if you see that they're this bloody super early, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it does mean that they can't necessarily capitalize as well on some of those uh, first kills as maybe another team would be able yep. to. So like, there's still room for improvement there. Um, I don't know. I've made no secret about how much I love CLG and I do think they're like a legitimately strong team. I think best of fives are going to be a very big test for them though, yep. because I think, and I'll say the same thing about C9 for different reasons, but I think it's going to be really difficult, especially after what I saw this week for any team to crack into that top three of yeah. TL, uh, TL hundred thieves and EG. Hmm. I mean, okay, what about what about C9? Because 
we don't need to necessarily answer the top four question because that's going to be something for the future. And I don't actually, we, I think we've done enough of the matchup preview between CLG and Cloud9. I don't want to hard focus yeah. on that because we'll be doing that in the future. But more like holistically, this split for Cloud9, where the start was definitely very slow. Berserker losing his passport, getting over a week late, Zven having visa delays. Uh, and very honestly, them just having no practice time as a squad until they are already mid split, which to me actually excuses more of their loss streak than the like, oh, we did or did not have our full roster until X amount of time. Like they, mm-hmm. they in a sense, got a lot of wins that I don't think would have been repeatable based on their quality of play early on in the split. So 10 and 8 is actually a pretty good ending based on their like average quality of play throughout the split. But they would be the team for me where the talent on the team is the most, like, it's the sum of all parts. Like, the Mm. talent on this team, when performing all at a high level and sinking, is like a 15-win team if everything was perfect. So their chances of either pulling it together in playoffs or even dropping loser's bracket and making a run I think are just very, very high. Uh, but they like they had one kind of good game today in the tiebreaker against FlyQuest, and they had two better games earlier in the week. Bad game against TG today in terms of some team fighting. But yeah, a little bit of an inconsistent team, but just so much talent that I see. Yeah, that is so the thing for C9, and I know people always hate when analysts say this because they feel like it's a cop-out, but... I truly mean it when I think that their ceiling is just so massively high. Um, And I feel like we haven't even seen what this team is close to being capable of doing. If, if all things are like working according to plan in terms of their coordination. Um, But we have, yeah, we haven't seen that happen. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's been, I know like the, the podcast before their kind of disastrous week seven, against CLG and 100 Thieves, the two of us were talking about, like, they o- they over-rely on individual outplays, but it's yeah. okay. And my my side of it was, but it's okay because they're continuing to improve. And your side of it was, they over-rely on individual outplays, <laughs> and that's not good. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and you ended up being right, right? Because they had a really, really down week. And I think um, their drafting can be a bit inconsistent, uh, I love. I actually loved the composition against FlyQuest today. It the, was the, such an outdraft. The Zillion oh Yumi goodness. comp was so good. So, like, I think in a best of five uh, with drafts like back to back to back, and you're adjusting in the moment, um, maybe that will will suit them more, and they'll be able to pivot because they do have the players to be able to make those draft adjustments. Um, and I think we've seen kind of. The we've seen some really great drafts from them, and we've seen some really not good drafts mm-hmm, from mm-hmm. them as well. And it's been incredibly varied. Um, and I think that variance, in addition to their trying to improve team synergy, um, has not served them well in in single games. Which is they're they're the other team that I'm the most curious about. Is like okay, how does this translate to best of five? Right, yeah. right? like when you guys get to best of five and you have a whole chunk of games back to back to back, what is that drafting now going to look like when you have to make adjustments? I do think this team, and obviously, like people will be thinking of that C nine team from last split where everyone was super, super hypercritical of their drafting, and in particular, Summit's champion pool, mm-hmm. once teams started to figure it out and actually started to ban those champions and really slam top lane dives constantly. I don't think there's a very simple way into like breaking apart this C9 team mm. um, as there was in spring, but I also think they haven't... They have not showcased the coordination necessary to yet and again that's where the ceiling thing comes in because you just know how how talented these players are um to be able to say definitively like oh man they're gonna make like a massive run but i think of so of any team outside of the top three we already listed i think c9 are the most poised to be that like shocking team 
just because of the talent that's available on this team, because of what I said previously, like my mind hasn't changed in terms of yes, an over-reliance on outplays, but if they get it together, uh-huh. man, it's going to look like sick. Most likely so I want to be, see it. Most likely to be the EG of spring would be the C9 of summer. <laughs> but also, <sighs> Summit, if if they just keep them, Renekton's coming back in meta. <laughs> who, who knows what will oh, be happening God. in the summer split? He was a, he was a win condition in half of their games. I think that will actually be a big point looking back like a year from now if this thing doesn't work, right? Of like Because mm. that was such a hard decision Jack had to make in the offseason. Such a ridiculously hard decision. The first time we've ever had a league MVP from spring just not be on the team in summer. Like that's how... Like, yeah. completely unprecedented. Then they lose three more games in the next split than they did in the previous split. So this playoffs, I think there's a lot of reasons this, like, has to work for the changes that they made going into summer. And we, we all agree that the ingredients are there. So it'll just be about mm-hmm. seeing it. Uh, I only want to talk about one more team. I want to talk about FlyQuest, who, who had, like, the weirdest week. They had the weirdest week. Because <laughs> if this wasn't a end of 2022 recap and they didn't play that tiebreaker game you know how f- mm-hmm. freaking positive we'd be on them they yeah. 3 owed takui had two player of the games they clutched out all these team fights they moved their way up to 10 and 8 it was a great week really until until they just get absolutely slammed by c9 and you're like oh okay that's the difference is kind of what we think now and it would almost seem like it's going to take a lot for them to beat team liquid but Still a successful split overall, I think, so far. Yeah, I mean, I think the the big thing for me for this FlyQuest team is that weirdly, and I know um, you and I have talked about this on desk, I feel like their performance this, uh, their performance this summer has impressed me more than their performance in spring. Mm-hmm. Like I think they're, um, I think they're, you know, competition-wise, I think they were going up against some stronger teams at the top as well, um, or at the very least, maybe some better teams like dimensionally at the top. Yeah, I mean, they did win an extra uh, game this split as well, and I think they lost a few close ones that it felt like they were in control of. So their record could have yeah. been better. Yeah, I mean, like, they definitely want that TL game back, the yeah. the first one, for example. Um, and if I they think got they... that back, they'd actually have the same record as TL. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow, they would, because, yeah, yeah, TL would, would drop another game. Off of TL. Um, I think they're, when they do pick for, because obviously, I think Johnson has, like, one of the highest. The highest. I was looking at it earlier. He, has that, he still has the highest counter pick rate. Okay. Um. They they know like how they want to draft for these late game team fights, uh, and I appreciate that from them as well because I feel like they have a very clear idea of like the team that they want to be. Um, I think they still, uh, and this is kind of counterintuitive to a team that likes to have these like five uh, five five team fighting like late game team fighting compositions. But I still think some of their setups uh, are rough. Um, or, or kind of delayed around uh, Drake and Harold. And then additionally, I think that um, they still really need Tukoy to have a strong laning phase mm-hmm. and Jose to have successful ganks uh, either, actually across all three lanes. I was going to say either bot or top, but it could be across the entire map. Um for this team to kind of bridge the gap to the late game team fighting. And that doesn't always happen, right? Like Mm -hmm. I will say it's pretty rare that I can't, I can only think of like one or two games where I felt like Tukoy has been, has had a really rough game. So he's usually like consistently good, sometimes outstanding. And he's such a massive part of this team's success. I think not just for what he can do in team fights, which is, incredibly obvious right because it's just his mechanical skill but Mm -hmm. like um when he is able to 
either absorb pressure from the enemy team in mid or just have enough stability to give Jose coverage for what he wants to do because his pathing still sometimes is not the most efficient. Mm -hmm. I think it's so important for this team. And I, I still see them as a like mid jungle team, even when compositionally, I feel like all people see is like, the late game, Johnson is, you know, counterpicking on a hyper carry and we're going to get him in a position to succeed. Yeah, it's the mid jungle that gets them there the majority of the yeah. time if it does and their synergy together. And I I do want to call out like kind of how above their weight class FlyQuest has been able to play this split, even if things don't necessarily go well for them in the playoffs. Like they're just felt in the off season, there just felt like there was such a massive gap between the EG Hunter Thieves TL C9 and the rest. And there was like this pack mm-hmm. of six teams and CLG and FlyQuest have just been so head and shoulders better than TSM Golden Gardens Immortals and Dignitas. Like they're in a completely different class, even though I think the resources that these teams had to play with were very similar. So really really well done i would say by the players on FlyQuest, by the staff on FlyQuest, to get to this point and if they do shock tl in a series or if they do make it higher it is such a difficult feat to be able to pull off mm-hmm. so um a lot of that does have to do in like how do these teams get there they find value where others don't necessarily know to look they were willing to give jose diodo that extra year of lcs time There were other Mm -hmm. higher tier organizations that wanted to get Jose Diodo in their organization, but weren't willing to give him LCS right away. FlyQuest did. He got that experience. He's better this year. They look to minor leagues like the LFL, find a former MVP, bring him in, start him right away. And he's rewarding them, right? So they've done, they just made a lot of really good bets. I feel like both CLG and FlyQuest to get to this point, which I just, I want to acknowledge it in this moment because I don't know if we're going to have time to acknowledge it if they end up losing in the playoffs. Yeah. Uh, the other big one for me is Philip. actually. Like, I know um, that a lot of people are going to be, like, hypercritical of his mistakes, right? Because he makes very obvious ones because he's a new player. He needs experience. Um, I know, like, you uh, pointed out a, a really kind of crucial mistake in a game. Yep. Um, Raz pointed out another one. Um, those are kind of things that come from experience. I know a lot of people have pointed out uh, some problems in his laning phase, even when it looks like he's doing kind of well, like, you know, he could be pushing his advantages more, that kind of thing. But I think overall, he's surprised me so much because talking to uh, a few of the coaches and in particular one coach that worked like really, really closely with him, it was a, obviously a huge proponent of Philip because he believed in him, but also told me flat out, like, I don't think he's LCS ready. Mm. I think he's going to get slammed in lane a lot. I think he's really going to struggle. I do think he's a great fit for this team personality wise. And the team themselves have said that the thing that's impressed me the most about Philip, because I do think you can rip him apart for this, like minute decision-making that is just going to come from getting more reps and getting more experience and, and reviewing stuff like that afterwards and being like, okay, next time I'm in this situation, I'm not going to do that. Um, but his entry into some team fights has been weirdly good. Like again, okay. there's some there are some wonky ones that you can point out, but like he's always looking for an angle. He's always mm-hmm. looking for a play. Um, and this is something's been backed up by like talking to his teammates as well. And I really appreciate that because the the kind of stage that was set for Philip is that oh he's going to be super bad super bad in lane uh you know he's really going to get outclassed yeah. by other LCS tops and it's going to be a problem it hasn't i will say this for for the things you can point out in lane i feel like it hasn't been nearly as nearly as big of a problem as it was initially yep. sold to me yep um and then additionally it seems like he is always trying to think about what they can do next. He is always trying to think about a proactive play. He does want to help his team. He does want to join up with his team and and have these really good 5v5 fights like their compositions are designed to do. Um, And so it's been really cool to see him come and have so much like relative success 
Mm -hmm. um, based on like what people told me about him, which was basically that, no, he's not ready. Yes, he's a great fit for the team personality and like culture wise. And we feel like, you know, by a certain point that will eclipse because we yeah. believe in his ability to improve. Yeah. And for what it's worth, they have a lot. They have a lot more league to play. They have a best of five. If they lose that, mm -hmm. they then get another best of five against either TSM or Golden Guardians. If they win that, they will get yet another best of five. So it's like probably nine to 15 more games where they can continue to develop. So really still the playoffs are long and lots can change in them. But I... I believe that'll do it for, for the analysis we've done on the top six. Yep. The analysis for TSM Golden Guardians can wait. Finish in the top six next time. Then we'll talk about you at the end of our end of our recap. Any any just final thoughts you'd like to add, Emily? I think the top I'm really happy with the top six of LCS, actually. I feel like oh, there's yeah. something complimentary and and more importantly like obviously they all have flaws like yes even eg mm -hmm. makes mistakes and has flaws um and like you said like oh if teams study like con for a you were using an example of contracts but like i do jungle pathing spreadsheets every week i can tell you yeah. every team has patterns like there are always yeah. <laughs> patterns to find right that's so interesting to watch when you get to best of fives um but i'm really happy with our with our lcs top yeah. six this this uh, summer like I think you have six teams that are all willing to do some interesting and creative things and that makes me happy this might be the biggest win gap between sixth and seventh we've ever had boof yeah Ten and eight versus <laughs> six and twelve maybe that's part of why we feel so good about six we're like you know what these are very clearly the top six. Like no one's yeah. going to argue that anyone else could sneak up into there. Okay. Looking forward to playoffs. That's going to be starting next week on Saturday and Sunday. Thank you once again, Emily, for joining me on JLXP. Nice. 71 episodes in the books. And I'll see everybody next time.